Jingle bells, jingle bells. The whole shopping mall is filled with the spirit of Christmas. Lights, trees, decorations, and people milling about everywhere in a mad rush to find the perfect Christmas present. My wife Pat and I have been looking forward to this for weeks. For once we're allowed to go out to shop together, to be alone, away from home. I feel bad that we're given so little money for shopping. Everything is expensive, nothing is on sale. And like all parents, we want to find presents that make our kids happy. In the end, we decide on a small dollhouse for our daughter and some games and simple presents for the boys. They're going to love it. And just as we're about to get the presents wrapped, the phone rings. Reluctantly, Pat answers the phone. Her whole body changes. Her eyes don't smile anymore. I can feel her frustration. And I was right. It's him calling. He says we have to come back immediately, that we've been out too long already. And just like that, the Christmas joy that I was feeling moments before is gone. We know the rules. We have to do what he says. We have to obey. Why can't we just take the time we need? Why does he have the right to tell us what to do? This moment happened 10 years ago. For 38 years, I've been part of this community. The truth is, for 38 years, I had been part of a cult. I had been feeling small, insignificant, and deprived of basic freedom for a long time. But it wasn't until I saw Pat's face when she was talking on the phone that I realized how bad it was. In that one moment, I felt smaller than I ever had. I was no more than a caterpillar crawling through a life I didn't want anymore. I'm sure many of you have heard the story of the caterpillar turning into a beautiful butterfly. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be like the butterfly, to grow wings and fly to freedom. So how did I get into this situation? Why was I in a cult for that long? To explain that, I have to go back to the beginning. I was born in Ethiopia. My father was a teacher there. When I was three and a half, my family moved to Chicago. Then when I was seven, we moved to Geneva in Switzerland, and four years later, to Norway, where my parents are from. During my adult years, I lived in India, Nepal, Thailand, first doing volunteer work, and more recently, working as a coach, consultant, and a corporate trainer. A year and a half ago, I moved back to Norway. For the past 10 years, this is how I've introduced myself. It sounds good, it's true, but it's not the whole truth. I didn't mention the cult. I was ashamed. I didn't want people to know. I wasn't always ashamed of who I was. Here I am, a couple years old, standing by a lake in central Ethiopia, meeting another boy for the first time. I was happy, bold, curious, unashamed, and obviously not trying to cover up anything. <laughs> then I was like a butterfly, ready to take on whatever the world had to offer. A few years later, all that changed. When I was in school in Switzerland, they had this end-of-the-year tradition that all the students, teachers, and parents gathered in the auditorium to celebrate the students' achievements for the past year. All the students, each class, was lined up on stage, not alphabetically, but by academic results. On one side, the clever kids. On the other side, the losers. They got rewarded with big presents. And we, yes, I was on the loser side. We got small presents. It felt so unfair. And no matter how hard I tried to improve, every year I ended up on the same side of the lineup, feeling humiliated and embarrassed. 
No matter how hard I tried to improve, I ended up there, and I started feeling like I wasn't good enough, not smart enough. My family moved to Norway. I was the new kid in a class where all the others had known each other forever. I was insecure, I didn't have friends, and kids can be cruel. I was bullied badly every day. They beat me up, they tied me up in the hallway, they called me names. I hated going to school. It was a vicious cycle. I felt alone, I didn't feel I belonged. I remember my classmates talking about what they wanted to do with their lives, their goals, their dreams. One wanted to be a doctor, another wanted to get into the oil industry. Me? I didn't think that far ahead. All I wanted was a friend. I just wanted to be accepted and liked for who I was. I didn't even know who I was anymore. And maybe you're wondering what about my parents? They didn't know. I mean, they were great parents, but I was just too ashamed to tell them how I felt. Then one day when I was 18, my school in Oslo invited this new Christian group to come and talk about what they did and what they believed in. <laughs> I had never seen anything like it in my life. These guys, they were singing, dancing, so happy. And they told us how they were helping people. They were helping drug addicts get off drugs, get off the streets. And when they told us how they all lived together in a community, I could just imagine what it would be like to live with people like that. So I went to visit them from time to time. Soon I was visiting them every day. They made me feel good about myself. They seemed to represent everything that I'd been missing, that I wanted, friendship, acceptance, purpose. As soon as school was over, I moved in with them. I remember one day we went to this hangout for drug addicts, young kids, high on drugs. They looked miserable, sick, hungry, and we talked to them, we gave them food. It felt really good to be helping someone. We also spent a lot of time studying the Bible, going on the streets, talking to people about God. <laughs> I had never done that before. And I didn't even believe in God before, and it felt strange at first, but I got used to it. And I was happy. My life had meaning. I had friends. After about a year or so, I started to hear rumors from some of the people I met that the group I was in was actually a cult, that it was dangerous, that I should get out. I didn't believe them. I didn't want to. Finally, my life was coming together. I was in a bubble surrounded with friendship and love. I wasn't going to give that up. And I was convinced that what I was doing was the right thing. So after a couple years, I moved with the organization to Asia. We were teaching orphans. We gave educational materials to poor schools. I spent weeks doing relief work after the tsunami in southern Thailand. But it was a cult, and I was being brainwashed. That bubble was becoming more and more like a cage. I was surrounded by restrictions. My whole life was controlled by others, by the leaders. In the group, I, I wasn't allowed to read anything except the Bible and what was written by the founder. I wasn't allowed to listen to music if it wasn't made by the group. There was no dating, only marriage within the group. I had to obey the leaders. I wasn't even supposed to think my own thoughts, just accept what I was told to believe. So why would I be in a group with rules like that? Looking back now, even I have a hard time understanding why, but back then, for the first time I could remember, I was happy about who I was and what I was doing. It was a price I was willing to pay for my happiness. And I didn't really think I had a choice. There was nobody physically holding me back from leaving, but I was made to feel that if I left, I would be failing God. And it would be like admitting that everything I had done and believed for over 30 years was wrong, that most of my life was a failure. So when I stood there in the mall that Christmas 10 years ago and I saw Pat's face and 
the feeling of resentment and anger welding up inside me. I told myself, enough is enough. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't, being controlled, being told what to do, we had to leave. Finally, a few months later, after 38 years in the cult, we left. I was so excited about my newfound freedom. I tried to imagine what my new life would be like, but I didn't understand how extremely difficult the journey would be. I was 56. I'd never finished my education. I didn't have money. I didn't have a house. I'd hardly faced life on my own. And I didn't understand how difficult it would be to get rid of my past. Getting out of the cult was the easy part. Now I had to get the cult out of me. I wasn't just trying to change my life. I was trying to figure out my whole identity, who I was, what I believed. And in my search, I started reading a lot. And one of the things that interested me the most was books about personal development. Napoleon Hill, Tony Robbins, Brendan Burchard. It was like a whole new world opened up to me, a world where I could be in charge, where I could design my own destiny. I read book after book. I went to seminars. I took courses, and everything I learned seemed to be written just for me. I could relate so well. And they give advice like, be positive, believe you can do it, look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself, I am awesome. <laughs> it's good advice, but the problem is our brain's main function is to keep us safe, to keep us from risk, from change, from stepping outside the comfort zone. And because I was so used to thinking of myself as a caterpillar, my brain did everything it could to boycott any effort I made to change. I tried visualization. I tried telling myself I was good enough, strong enough, all that stuff. And still, my brain refused to believe what I told it. I tried again and again. And in the end, I almost gave up. I was ready to accept fate and live the rest of my life as a caterpillar. I was sad, but I didn't know what else to do. Then one day, I again read something that talked about the caterpillar and the butterfly, but this time, I saw it in a different light from a new perspective, and I realized that the whole story we're told our entire lives is wrong. We cannot change into a butterfly. Why? Because we're not born caterpillars. We're not born confined to a limited life. We're not born like the caterpillar whose only purpose is to one day transform into something beautiful. No, we are born butterflies. We are born free, beautiful, with unlimited potential and possibilities. There was an article in Psychology Today called, Do People Really Change? It's a great question, and the author Dr. Seth Billahan says, yes, people do change. But he ends the article by saying, I do suspect, based on my own experience as a therapist, that a lot of personality change is actually a return to a person's level of functioning before the anxiety, depression, or other condition. In other words, we don't change into something new, we unchange. We change back to what we were from the very beginning, to the butterfly that was there the whole time. To me, this was the missing key. Once I understood that, my brain started helping me change instead of hindering me. It also helped after the cult that I wasn't alone anymore. I had Pat, I had my family, I had friends, real ones. And still, it's taken a long time to get this far. And to be honest, I'm still working on it. To get back 
to the freedom I had as a little kid in Ethiopia. And to move forward with this process, I have to tell my story. I'm ready to come out, to be honest, to stop hiding, to stop being ashamed. I also hope that my story will help others. In the past, when I was struggling through life, I thought I was the only one. Now I realize that the problems I had are a lot more common than I thought. I was never alone in how I felt. I was in a cult and they settled for a life that is less than it could have been, just like I did. It doesn't have to be that way. Everywhere around us, there are people, children and adults, feeling exactly like I did. They think they have to change who they are to be accepted and loved. They don't have the courage to be themselves. They let the opinions of others define who they are. And all they need is for you to be there, your attention, your reassuring smile, your helping hand, a hug. I promise you, if you do this, if you connect with a butterfly within yourself and encourage everyone you meet to do the same, the world will be better, more beautiful, and full of butterflies. Thank you.